Hello and welcome to VOW, Voices of Wisdom, the show that might not be for everybody, but everybody needs to watch this show. I have an extraordinary guest on my show today. His name is David Bun Martin. He's an artist and especially consists of Native American series, science fiction series, spiritual series, landscapes, and one of his wonderful specialties I love is custom portraits. Hi, David. Hi, How are you? Very well, thank you. So, tell us a little bit about yourself. You were born and raised in Southampton? Yes, I was. Yeah, I, I was raised in Southampton. I'm currently director of the Shinnecock Museum since 2002. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was here uh, as a kid in the 60s, 70s. I remember when it was quiet and it wasn't... <laughs> you said quiet. Yeah, huh? very few cars on the road. Even <laughs> then, you know, it was really different. But... Uh, yeah, and, and uh, I enjoy it, you know. The so did you go to Southampton High School? Yes, oh, I graduated in 78. Yeah, okay. 1978. I was always in the arts, though, of course. Yeah, and I enjoyed I learned oil painting, actually, in high school. Robert Millenhausen was my art teacher. Okay. He was a very nice teacher and uh, gave us a lot of freedom to ex experiment in, in the media. Great. And uh, it was just wonderful uh, being raised in the, an artistic area, of course, the East End here. Uh, and then uh, being able to express my heritage That's and history wonderful. in the, in the wonderful. arts. That's yeah. But you talk about ex experience in your history, but you have a lot of history in your family with art. Mm -hmm. And that's where you got a lot of your inspiration or some of your inspiration yes, from? Yes, it was. Some of my earliest inspiration actually was from my mother more directly. And she studied art in, in college. She was mm -hmm. a singer, actually, a professional really? concert singer in classical style. She had different um, opera singers that were mm. teachers, uh, and then she studied the arts in college, the painting and so forth. And then uh, my grandmother's father, my great-grandfather, who was Shinnecock Montauk Indian, uh, his name was Charles Bunn, Charles Sumner Bunn. He mm -hmm. was a professional guide and hunter to many of the wealthy people on the East End here mm -hmm. during the la late 19th century, early 20th century. And he made the, the, the beautiful duck decoys, you know. Really? Yeah, they were very, very uh, valuable today. Uh, he was one of the top guides in the United States. Uh, he was a, a terrific shot, you know. And mm. they, they hunt, hunted uh, uh, offshore birds, shorebird hunting, which was some of the best in the United States, mostly geese. Duck snipe, mm -hmm. uh, and he took out hunting parties, you know, mostly around the reservation really? in Southampton. Yeah. And what when time was era was this? Uh, 1880, 1890s to 1930s, really? mm, 40s. Yeah, and he had a, a workshop. His father, though, was a whaler, and it goes back uh, even before then, of course. But because uh, the Shinnecock people w worked in wood, you know, they were wood crafts people. And other and, and wampum beads, of course, mm -hmm. wampum manufacture with the quahog clamshell beads. Mm -hmm. But uh, my great grandfather Charles Bunn, a uh, uh, great great grandfather rather, David Walkus Bunn, was a whaler, and he was one of the ten men uh, from the reservation that drowned on the Circassian ship in 1876 off Meacox Bay. And uh, they made scrimshaw, which was done from uh, the ivory of the whale teeth, mm. you know, on the shipboard, the ships around went around the world. They left from Sag Harbor, which is known as the, as the Harbor, New Bedford, Nantucket, and they went either to the South, South Atlantic or the South Pacific. And he went on voyages as long as two, three years at a time, and they all did this work in uh, ivory on the shipboard. So uh, he uh, experienced that, and then my, my uncle David was a commercial artist, you know. He was a photographer and mm -hmm. wood carver as well, and so it was natural for me to get into the arts. What is also your background, your um, heritage background? Yeah, well. There's Hungarian and what's the exactly. other? Exactly. Well, I, I always, um, I, I have three major ones. I wrote a book recently with, with the names in the title, uh, uh, The Oral History of a Shinnecock Apache Hungarian uh, Family. It's mm -hmm. the oral history of my family. Uh, my father's from Hungar Hungary. He was born in Budapest, Hungary, and uh, his his father was an architect. You know, he, he's he's a musician today. He's mm -hmm. still still doing a lot of work in Brooklyn, New York. Really? He's a music director, voice teacher. This is your grandfather. Uh, my father. Oh, your father. Yeah. Oh, okay. His name is Thomas Siklos. Mm -hmm. He has a Hungarian name, mm -hmm. and. Um, 
he was, has, that's how my mother met uh, him because he was an accompanist to her voice teacher. Oh, wow. This is in the late 50s. Mm -hmm. And so he was working with some of the Broadway producers, you know. He, he was into music. He was trained actually in the Franz Liszt Academy in Budapest in classical piano. And he won, he won a first place award in the competitions way back during, I guess, shortly before World War II or somewhere, somewhere around that time. Mm. And so, but he was into music, of course, and I, I always enjoy music. You know, mm -hmm. I used to sing in church choirs and mm -hmm. all. And then, um, then my, uh, so that was my dad. My mother, uh, the Native American side is from my mother, mm -hmm. Marjorie Martinez, who was Shinnecock Apache. Mm -hmm. Uh, her father, my grandfather, maternal grandfather's name was Charles Martin, who, Jr., the, his stepfather was uh, Apache, an Apache scout named Martin, who, if you read about the history of Geronimo and the Apache Wars, uh, Geronimo and Kate, I mean, uh, Martin and Keita were two of the government's paid scouts who helped to persuade Geronimo to surrender in the la uh, for the last time in 1886. Now, the Apache people, uh, Chiricahua, his tribe, my grandfather's um, biological father, though, was killed fighting the government, fighting the cavalry in 1886, shortly before surrender, and his name was Chin Chi. Mm. And uh, we never saw him. You know, he was never photographed or anything. No. All the only father my grandfather knew was Martin, and there's been a lot of documentaries he's written about in history books about Geronimo and so forth. All the, uh, his, my grandfather's own father was, uh, the, his name of his tribe was Nena, Chiricahua Apache. And they, their homelands were in northern Mexico for the most part. Okay. They didn't come into the United States, but the Chiricahua Apache tribe uh, occupied mostly the southeastern corner of Arizona where they acquired a reservation during the time of Cochise, the famous chief. Mm -hmm. He made a, a treaty with Tom Jeffords, who was a, who was a go-between between, between the army and, and the Apaches. Mm -hmm. So that was the homeland of the people, my grandfather's people. And of course, that was all taken. They lost 50 million acres of land when Geronimo surrendered in 1886. And all the people were held prisoners of war for 28 years. This is the longest period of confinement, I believe, of any Native American tribe in the history of the country. And actually, this year, 2014, they're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the final release of the group that were released by, uh, from confinement in 1914 mm. by act of Congress. Uh, they were, at that time, living at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And that's okay. where my grandfather was raised. Right. And in 1913, my grandfather's immediate family were, were released uh, for the first group. And then in 14, the remainder were released. And they were given the option of living on an allotment of land in Oklahoma or going to, to the Mescalero Apache Reservation in New Mexico to join other, others of the tribe mm -hmm. who were related to them. So some of my cousins are actually in both places, New Mexico and, and Oklahoma. But uh, they were, uh, yeah, they were held prisoners of war. They were in prison camps, you know. When he surrendered, they lost 50 million acres of land and went through uh, first to uh, Fort Pickens, Florida, and St. Augustine, Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the uh, men and women and children died because of the, the uh, malaria, yellow fever, the extreme humid conditions, which was much different than what they had in the Southwest. Absolutely. They, then they went up to uh, uh, Mount Vernon Barracks in Mobile, Alabama, which mm -hmm. because they, the government figured they wanted to, they were still dying, you know, and they tried to get them into a place where it wasn't as difficult for them as Florida, so they moved them to Alabama, which wasn't much better. And I think around 1897 or so, or, 90, or 1895, they moved back to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which was originally intended as a reservation for them. Mm -hmm. But the government eventually took it over as a military base and got, wanted to get rid of them, move them again, you know. So uh, Geronimo, of course, he never was allowed to return to Arizona. They, that, I think uh, he even appealed directly to Teddy Roosevelt about that. Mm. But uh, there was some... Uh, you know, there was some hard feelings between the, the settlers and the Apaches still. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess one of the, another reason was they said they couldn't guarantee his safety, you know. Mm. Uh, but uh, he, they, they were, he was one of the last holdouts to hold mm -hmm. people back, you know. And, um, but, um, so my grandfather eventually, to make a long story short, wound up coming east to school 
to uh, uh, Hampton Institute, which is currently Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Right, right. And uh, he came, eventually learned animal husbandry and farming and came up to Shinnecock Reservation and married my grandmother in 1920. And uh, so, and then of course the Shinnecock Montauk people uh, have been here for 10,000 years mm -hmm. on the island. That's what we concentrate on, on our, at our museum, the Shinnecock Nation Cultural Center Museum, which opened around in late, the, it was beginning to be form, formed in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, opened our doors to our current building in uh, 2001. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is our third and final location. And um, we have our main exhibition is called A Walk with the People, which goes into the 10,000 year history of the tribe and all really all Long Island Indian peoples, uh, which the archeologists categorize into six cultural phases, you mm. know, the, from the paleo, archaic, uh, woodland contact, um, what is a contact historic period? Uh, there's about five, per six periods there. And we highlight them with um, murals, artifacts. And we're being a cultural, uh, being a community museum, a lot of people have contributed their time and energies to putting together a wonderful museum, first rate really. And um, we really have a lot of regional importance because of the story we we're telling. Right, and where are you located again? We're on 100 Montauk Highway in Southampton, right? about a quarter mile east of uh, SUNY Stony, uh, Stony Brook, Southampton mm -hmm, campus. Mm -hmm. And we're a log cabin right on the mm -hmm. corner of Montauk Highway and Westgate Road. Right. And I think the people would enjoy coming. We welcome everyone to come and experience the culture. And that's one of the reasons we built the building is to be able to invite people to come. Right, right. And we can tell our story on our own terms and, and from our own points of view, and, and of course, Native, the Native American culture in general has had to, had to always address stereotypes, you know, and misconceptions and mythology. And so you told me early that actually people come in sometime questioning, not necessarily questioning, but having their own opinion. So I think it's what you're doing is awesome because they need to be educated. Yes. And so how do you approach, how do you deal with the that educational piece of people come in and yeah. kind of twisting the story around from what they see on television. Yeah. So well, what is your approach generally? Mm -hmm. Well, we try to uh, actually um, be very accurate mm -hmm. and very, but also try to present an interesting story to people um, that is factual in the sense that we're, we try to, if we encounter stereotypes or gross misunderstanding, mm -hmm. mis misapprehension, I guess. Mm -hmm. We try to correct that immediately, um, and we realize that people, um, they, and also muse, the museum profession itself is responsible for that, not just movies, TV, and the mass media, but absolutely the way the Native American or any indigenous people are depicted in, in, the, uh, in museums, mm. and that has been put, put forward by anthropologists and archaeologists. Um, that really gives people a wrong idea. Right. Uh, if, if things are changing now. Things are much better than they used to be mm -hmm. because Indians are, are Native Americans are finally having a voice in the profession. There are more Native Americans in the museum profession and, mm -hmm. and anthropological areas mm -hmm. than there ever was before. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a vehicle, that was a tool of, of, um, of, uh, of, of um, stereotypes as well, the, the idea or ethnocentrism, Eurocentric mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. where they right. would try to, rather than putting themselves into the shoes of the people to get to know them better, right. they, they tried to um, just look at them with the wrong kind of viewpoint, you know. <laughs> so, Absolutely. But Absolutely. we try to just give facts, facts and educate and, and correct any misapprehensions. We used to always say, well, people would say, well, we buff, are we we're not buffalo hunting teepee living <laughs> Indians. You know, we, we didn't follow the herds like the, the, our brothers in the plains did, but the only time we followed herds was during the paleo period, which is mm -hmm. about 8,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and they had caribou here. Mm -hmm. But since that time, we have been uh, semi-nomadic. We mm -hmm. would uh, vary uh, our locations uh, because of the season. We right. might go, for example, to which was known as um, Canoe Place or 
Hampton Bays uh -huh, today uh -huh. to live during the winter because it was really? a little more protected. Really? And then during the summer season, we'd come back to um, the current reservation area, which is a peninsula, and could farm better there. The now, this went better. on in what period of time? This is educating to yeah, educating me now. Uh -huh. around, around the time of colonial settlement, mm. say. Or it began to be curtailed at that time because mm -hmm. we had to deal with a lot of some problems during the early colonial settlement time. Uh, in Southampton, of course, that was 1640. Right. And when areas began to be designated as being off limits, you know, uh, our original hunting and, and settlement patterns were altered. So I'm going to stop you because I think mm -hmm. you just said that you began to be restricted from where you were able yeah. to, to hunt? Yeah, that's one of the first things because not only hunting, but for example, um, we needed certain natural materials to make our wick, what was known as wick, wigwams, you know, mm -hmm. our dome-shaped thatched right, houses, right, right. or even some of our traditional foods, which one of, a couple of them were tuberous type foods like Jerusalem artichokes or ground nuts, mm -hmm, for example, mm -hmm. which required digging in the soil. Mm -hmm. And then we would actually store food in a, a root cellar, like sub, semi-subterranean mm -hmm. uh, pit. And, of course, these are some of the things that some of the colonial authorities didn't like because they brought in cattle and sheep, and sometimes the cattle and sheep would stumble over the pits that we had for root cellars. And then they didn't like the idea originally maybe of, uh, you know, digging... Uh, the uh, ground nuts or, or Jerusalem. I'm not sure how, how much disturbance that would cause, but I know that also at one point the, there was prohibition against um, uh, harvesting the cattail or the uh, bulrush reed, you mm -hmm. know, to any extent. Mm -hmm. I know this might have been even more severe uh, against the Montauk people, mm -hmm. who we were very closely related to, who were about from here east, of course. Right. The Mont this, we're in the terrain here, territory of the Montauk people, mm -hmm. who we were very closely related to. Mm -hmm. And they had prohibitions of, against that. Then the, but they wanted to hire us, of course, when the, we taught them the early offshore whaling techniques. And they knew that we were expert sailor seamen. We knew the behavior of the whale. That was considered a gift of the creator. Right. Uh, it was a spiritual kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were very good harpoonists because mm -hmm. we had traditionally made all these tools with, with ivory, with bone ivory, and it was, they were very expert. And actually the toggle-headed harpoon uh, head was something we invented, and it was actually copied in the whaling industry in iron, you know, and some of these uh, fo forges, uh, the, uh, the smiths, the blacksmiths who took it over copied a lot of our original designs and for the harpoons. But strangely enough, they hired the, the, like our people to be hired to work for the crews to hunt the whale, but they didn't want us in, in town after, after in the evening. Or they didn't and this was in Southampton? In Southampton, I think. Or the, uh, the, the we'll call, you couldn't bring in harping irons, you know, into town. They figured. But you see, a part of this had to do with around the time of the Pequot War, for example. Okay, and what it, is that? The Pequot War was the, actually it was a war, almost a war of extermination against the Pequot pe tribe in Connecticut. Oh, okay. This is during the time when the colonial, uh, the English authorities, you know, were trying to solidify their power. Mm -hmm. And we were involved only peripherally to that. We weren't directly involved. Right. But they were a little afraid, you know. The colonial authorities were afraid because at the, after that time, you had the uh, Pequot War was 1638, and then you had King Philip's War, which is 1670, mm -hmm. more or less, where they burned enormous amount of towns in New England. King Philip was a Wampanoag chief. And the authorities had to deal with them, you know, and they, they tried, they really, uh, intimidation, of course, was one of the uh, things that we had to deal with um, after the Pequot War uh, or after King Philip's War where they, they would bring in some of the people involved in some of those uh, conflicts and bring them down here and kind of parade them around and because there was, there was very little conflict here among our people and mm -hmm. the English settlers. Mm -hmm. um, there was intertribal warfare. It's quite of a complex history, but mm. uh, 
to make a long story short, we had a chief here who I bought a painting of right here, Wyandanch, who was the head of the Montauk tribe. Mm -hmm. And he was very close to Lion Gardner, who he gave Gar Lion Gardner Gardner's Island, of course. Oh, because really? he, Lion Gardner was an intermediary between Wyandanch, the Montauk people, and the Shinnecock people, or the colonial authorities who were based in Hartford, mm -hmm. in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. But again, um, the, some of the more um, activist chiefs were trying to get some of our people to ally with them, you know, after wow. the, the defeat in order to solidify their power politically. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, of course, there was turmoil, you know, the people were fighting to be able to change their original mode of living to the new economy. Mm -hmm. They had to live, they had to survive for the most part. Right. And luckily, luckily for our people in Shinnecock, we were close to centers of, of, um, of getting work, jobs, economic centers, mm -hmm. unlike the Montauk people who were more isolated way out in the point. Right. And they had to walk distances into East Hampton or Sag Harbor to get right. work. Right. And it made them a little more vulnerable when the Long Island Railroad came in, which is many years later. Mm -hmm. And uh, they began to be, um, you know, very harshly dealt with. And wow. of course, we're, we uh, collaborate quite closely with Dr. John Strong, uh, Suffolk County Archaeological Association and their publications, Dr. Gaynell Stone. Mm -hmm. and, and we uh, have based a lot of our research on many of their works that have been compilations of many of the early, early documentation, you know, about what the early explorers saw, mm -hmm. the early observations about the cultural behavior of uh, the Native people. Mm -hmm coupled between the, them and some of the early preachers. We had Native American, our, our people, some of them became ministers, mm -hmm. were ordained. Mm -hmm. one, of the most, one of the most famous was Samson Ockham. Samson Ockham was a Mohegan missionary minister that was ordained actually here in Southampton really? by Reverend Buell. Hmm. Uh, he was ordained right here in East Hampton, I'm sorry, East Hampton, and he married a Montauk woman by the name of Mary Fowler whose husband, whose father, I believe, was half Shinnecock. Mm. And he uh, was actually uh, hired, he, he learned Latin and Greek and was one of uh, the preachers, Eliezer Wheelock's students who was in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And he eventually went to England to, to raise money for Dartmouth College. So he was one of the founders of Dartmouth College, wow. actually. But later on, he really became a fighter for Indian rights because he realized that some of the refugees after the Pequot Wars, the Indians began to lose their lands. Mm -hmm. And they be he, his idea was to try to uh, inspire them with Christian, Christian principles mm. as he saw them. And he mm -hmm. was actually a better Christian than, than the people who were supposed to be Christian. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, they began to gather around him and he started a movement called the Brother Town Movement. Uh, they were also known as the Christian Indians of New England. This is during the late 1700s okay. period, okay. 1780s through the 90s. And he started a movement actually to migrate west, and some of our people migrated west with him and others. His friend was another Fowler, was a Montauk guy, mm. Indian guy. He, they first went up to Oneida, New York, and got some land and lived there for a while, and mm -hmm. they went further west. So. Today we have actually some of our ancestors wound up going to Wisconsin. Okay. And there's a tribe over there called the Brother Town Indians of Wisconsin who are made up of other Indians besides Shinnecock, Montauk. Uh, it's, they're similar to a tribe called the Stockbridge Muncie tribe, which mm. uh, have descendants of Mohegans, Wampanoags, and other tribes from New England who eventually wound up going west. Is most of that in your book? This is your book that you I, wrote? Yeah, my the book called Time and Memories. I, did, I recorded mostly from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I don't have a whole lot of material that goes back that far. What I tried to do was I started recording her when I went away to college in the late 70s every summer, and then I wound up with 10, 12 tapes. Wow. Started hand transcribing it around 2000, and then I just self-published it recently, but a lot of the stories she tells was of her immediate relatives, some of the oldest. We have a picture. It's not in the book, but we do have pictures at our museum, a wonderful archival photo history uh, of a lady that was born in 1780. Uh, goes back that far, you know. Wow. Uh, but she has stories about her grandparents who were born in, say, 1840s, 1830s. Um, there was story, one of the stories that was told of another a, a relative 
it was during the revolution when mm. the in British, of course, occupied the East End and they had to run the Indians, that some of them were Montauk people, had to go hide in the caves somewhere. Really? To keep out of the way of the British. Wow. So this is, um, but some of the stories go into the old whaling traditions of the tribe. There's an uh, interesting man named Jason Mancini who has done a lot of research of our whaling voyages. And he's actually mapped it out with the satellite maps. Mm. And he recently did a presentation at Southampton Historical Museum. He's come to our museum too, Shinnecock Museum. And he talks about all the ships where our ancestors went and they wound up dying, some of them, in Hawaii and wow. New Zealand, all over the world. We only have almost a minute and a half left, and I okay. want to make sure we talk about mm -hmm. what we see here. It's just okay. awesome Thank work. You. And yeah, this is Wyand Dance. This is my interpretation of the... And these are yours. Yes. These are yours. This is oil on canvas. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of portraits. Um, this is my interpretation. Of course, he 17th century period. This is Kuan Yin. This is a Chinese goddess. I've always been interested in, in other religions, mm -hmm. spirituality, and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, this is a picture I call him um, Mokomando. Mokomando is one of the Shinnecock sachems that signed the original deed for the settlement of Southampton. Mm -hmm. For those who would like to see more of this history of our tribe, please give us a call at our museum. You can look in that camera. Yeah, uh, Shinnecock Nation Cultural Center Museum, and our number is 287-4923. And we have a, net, a living history village that we just made uh, we opened a, a year or two ago called the Wigan Living History Village, and you'll see what some of our Shinnecock settlement would have looked like in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And you have a few more that you might want to yes, show. These we have are some of the mirror, uh, 30 seconds these left. These are some of the posters that have been prepared by Matthew Ballard, it's one beautiful. of the staff members at the Shinnecock Museum. It's beautiful. And this is Anna and Rachel, and this is Brianna. These are members of the staff who will work at our Wigan it's Living beautiful. History Village. Beautiful. And Beautiful. they are interpreting our culture uh, based on a lot of actual, uh, we've revitalized many of our ancient arts, such as bulrush mat making, mm -hmm. uh, wigwam construction, dugout canoe manufacture, and you'll really experience a lot of very interesting culture if you come. So make sure you go visit the Shinnecock Museum. It's located at 100 Montauk Highway in Southampton. And the website, you can see that our website is going to be coming up shortly. And um, thank you, David. It was very, very informative. Oh, thanks so much, Brenda, for the invitation. You have a great day, hon. Huh?